Hi everyone. Good to see you on my channel today. Today I will tell you a wonderful story. It is full of love and kindness. I hope you enjoy it and I wish you an enjoyable viewing experience. Thank you. This summer day for six-year-old John did not begin quite as usual. It was not because he had not slept well and could hardly get his eyes open the next morning. Last night John's mother was sick again and the boy had to get up to fix her bed and get her medicine. Thank you, my little helper. You're the only one I have left, Karen said sadly. It's no trouble at all, Mommy. The main thing is that you, as soon as possible, get better, John said, stretching sleepily. He was aware that his mother needed his help and attention more than ever. Of course, Karen tried not to show her despair to her son, and, if possible, she held on as best she could. John never knew his father and he didn't want to ask his mother. The boy was used to the fact that it was always just the two of them, and he couldn't even imagine having a third person around. The trouble with John's mother had happened six months before, when she had slipped on the icy steps that led to the front door of their apartment building on her way back from the store with a bag of groceries. As she fell, her lumbar spine sustained the brunt of the impact, causing a compression fracture with a dislocation. Lying on the icy ground, the unfortunate woman desperately tried to get up, not knowing that she would be unable to do so. Passes beat passed by, thinking that the stranger had simply had too much alcohol on the eve of the Christmas holidays. Only ten minutes after her injury, a compassionate old lady from a nearby house called her an ambulance. Although the doctors did their best when they arrived at the trauma unit, their final verdict shocked Karen with its cruelty. I'm sorry but you will be in a wheelchair for the next few years. I can't deceive you. Yes, you know what I mean, said the attending physician with a sad sigh shortly before she was discharged. And what? I have no chance to get back on my feet. Trying to control himself, exclaimed Karen. The doctor looked intently into her eyes and then answered, no, don't be so catty. There is always a chance, a way out too. I know for sure that hospitals in Austria, Switzerland, or Germany can help you, although they say that there are clinics in the capital that specialize in treating this kind of trauma. Unfortunately, such a complicated surgery costs a lot of money, so it is unlikely to be good news for you. The doctor's words had an almost magical effect on the hopeless patient. At that moment, Karen was ready to collect at least a million dollars just to regain the ability to move, as before. But when the woman was discharged home, the realization of the bitter reality gripped her head. It seemed to Karen that life was over and there was no hope of healing anymore. Before that fateful accident, the woman had worked as a waitress in a roadside cafe and didn't have much money, of course. As an orphan, Karen could hardly count on anyone wanting to help her financially for the operation. The woman had no friends. And even if she had, it is unlikely they would be able to lend such a huge amount of money. Left alone with his heartache, Karen sat in a wheelchair by the window all day long and sadly watched the passers-by in a hurry about their business. And do not even know that somewhere near, a young woman suffering from intolerable mental and physical pain. All this could not remain unnoticed by her little son, John, for whom in the whole world there was no person closer and more dear. It was for this very reason that the little boy decided to help his mother find the money for the operation. John's plan did not withstand any criticism, but by and large, he did not really care. Determined to raise money for his mother's surgery, the boy began to act as his heart told him. It was hard to say what pushed John to take such a desperate step, but there was no doubt that the decision came from the heart. At first, the boy simply asked people on the street for money. But John wasn't able to be a beggar for long. First of all, not all of the passers by were wealthy people. And secondly, not everyone would agree to give money to a boy who was collecting money, to a boy who was collecting money for his sick mother with a cardboard sign in his hand. Initially, the sign was written in block letters with a couple of spelling mistakes in the words the correct spelling of which the boy simply didn't know. The inscription read, Help, good people, whatever you can, 
because it didn't say anything about why he needed money. Passersby treated him like any other street kid. Some tossed handfuls of change, some gave him a gingerbread or candy, and some hissed something vicious about how there were too many beggars nowadays. Six-year-old John tried not to pay attention to his enemies and scrupulously saved his money, putting them into a piggy bank. If only the boy could have known that, in order to get his mother's surgery, he would have to raise several hundred thousand of these piglets, stuffed with money. Karen suspected that her son was a beggar, and even reprimanded him for it a couple of times. Like any mother, she knew that it would do no good. But, being an invalid, it was not easy to keep an eye on the little boy, who had already managed to feel the freedom and imagine himself the main earner of the family. Karen was well aware that in the eyes of neighbors and acquaintances, she looked like an irresponsible mother who allowed such behavior on the part of her son. So many times, she asked John to stop begging on the streets and to give up the idea that it was possible to raise money for the operation in such a shameful way. But for the little boy, it seemed like the only way to help his mother recover and get back on her feet. If everyone in our city, or even the country, would give just one penny, we could raise the money in a couple of days. John dreamed while lying in bed. One day, standing with a cardboard sign outside the store, the boy saw an old janitor standing at a distance, feeding stray dogs with freshly saved breadcrumbs and bones. Dogs, cats, and even pigeons were circling the old man in the hope of getting their treats. The old man's friends squealed, mewed, and simply purred, and it was clear that this was not the first time he was doing such a procedure. Don't hurry so. It's enough for everybody. I've got a little present for everybody. Here's a fresh bone for you, Thunder, and a piece of meat for your friend, Suey. Yes, don't grumble and don't be jealous. He's got no teeth left, so he's entitled to his meat. And you are far from it, the old man said with a smile. Watching this scene from a distance, John was so interested in what he saw that he even forgot why he had come to the store today. The boy was very fond of animals, but to have a kitten or a puppy at home in their unenviable situation would now be an unaffordable luxury. John himself did not notice how he came closer and watched with interest the feeding of the street poor creatures. He could see that animals loved their benefactor, and so they were eager to lick his cheek in gratitude or to rub his wet nose in his hand. The old man waved his hand invitingly when he saw the young Zacatronel inviting him to participate in the distribution of presents. But may I, grandfather? What if they bite? Cautiously asked John. The elderly janitor smiled and, in a hurry to reassure the boy, said, No, they won't bite, kid. They are almost tame. In addition, human kindness is a mile away and will never hurt anyone who comes to them with a good thing. Here, come closer and stroke Savoy. He's an old man, but very kind. His master died two years ago. Can you imagine? So for about a year, Suey waited for him every night at the door of the house. Practically ate nothing. He almost made it, but he got to me just in time. That's the way it is, brother. John looked with interest at the dog, whose fur was as if pale silver, and in whose eyes shone a spark of reason. If the dog had known better, he would surely have wished him a pleasant day. John overcame his natural timidity and came closer to help the old man to distribute the gifts. Especially, the boy liked to feed pigeons, which sat on his hand and carefully nibbled the breadcrumbs from his small palm. The most interesting thing was that, at this moment, the dogs did not touch the cats, and the cats were indifferent to the birds, thus establishing an unspoken truce for the feeding time. It seemed to little John that he had entered a fairy tale, where every animal was not an animal at all, but a human converted by an evil sorceress. Not ten minutes later, the old man's bag was quickly emptied, and for the homeless animals, everything was back to normal. Dogs began to growl at the cats, and the cats, in turn, stared at the pigeons, weighed down by the nourishing food. I'm sorry we didn't manage to gather enough food this time, but that's all right. Well, never mind, said an elderly janitor, wiping away a tear. After seeing the dogs and cats fleeing, the old man smiled and turned to John, 
standing on his left hand. Who are you, kid? An orphanage boy or a homeless soul? The janitor cautiously asked. No, I'm not from an orphanage. I live around here. My mom's sick. She needs an operation, but she ain't got no money. So I thought I'd try to do it this way, John hastened to answer. The old man frowned at his words and his forehead furrowed with lines. Well, that's too bad. A sickness is no joke, brother. Your mother is in a good health, but I don't think you'll be able to raise the money on the street. I'll give you a hundred or so from my pension, but I don't think it's going to do much good. My name's Vincent, by the way. You're welcome. I live around here, in the basement anyway. I've got a recreation room and tools there, the janitor added. Thanks, Grandpa. And I'm John. But you can only call me that to my mother. And for the rest of us, I'm John and nothing else. The boy said in a mature manner. The old man nodded understandingly and hid a smile in the folds of his white beard. Good, John. I'll know. And you should rewrite the sign. First of all, it is misspelled. And secondly... You should specify the goals. You're not just collecting money for nothing, are you? Yeah. For my mom's surgery. So write it down. You want me to write you a petition on paper. All you have to do is write it down and that's it. So okay, the old man asked. All right, Grandpa, the boy exclaimed cheerfully. Then John was a little embarrassed as if he was gathering his courage to ask the old man an awkward question. Vincent, you're homeless, aren't you? You know, living in the basement and all that? The boy asked as gently as possible. The elderly janitor smiled again, and once again admired the boy's ingenuity. No, John, I'm not a bum. It's just the way things are. I mean, you're not just standing there with your hand out. I wouldn't exactly call you a beggar. Well, I don't feel like a bum either. My son died three years ago, and my daughter-in-law, a snake in the throat, grieved for a while, then kicked me out of the apartment. I wasn't suited to the vagabond life, so I became a janitor in exchange for the fact that I could equip the basement for my own needs, Vincent answered staggeringly. Only now John realized that because of his own carelessness, he had almost offended a good man. Meanwhile, the elderly janitor wrote the boy a blank for his new inscription and handed it to him. When John read the written word syllable by syllable, he immediately expressed his joy at such a literate phrase. Old Vincent had written it so thoroughly that any passerby would understand exactly what the boy needed the money for. Just be careful, okay? If you need anything, run to me. I'm right here. Today was my retirement day, so I gave my pets a treat. And there's not much left, but I'll share it with you anyway, said the old man and deftly slipped a crisp new bill into John's pocket. Thank you very much, Grandpa Vincent. If all people were like you, no one would probably get sick, John replied, sniffing his nose. The boy chatted with the janitor for a while, and then he ran home to his mother. John tried not to be outside for too long so that his mother would not be too sad and anxious. After meeting Vincent, the boy once again believed in a miracle and the victory of good over evil, as he had heard so many times from the heroes of domestic cartoons. On the way home, all John could think about was how he would rewrite the appeal on a cardboard. And from now on, he would raise money exclusively for his sick mother. As he passed the bus stop, the boy glanced for a moment at one of its side walls and froze in place. The wall was all over with advertisements for buying and selling providing services and other advertising and entertainment nonsense. John imagined for a moment a piece of paper with text written by an elderly janitor in their place, and he smiled enigmatically. The thought that had been hovering in the boy's mind and could not find a way out now took clear shape and became the most important goal for him. John suddenly imagined that he would write dozens of such ads, even in block letters, but that would not change the essence. The main thing was that he would be able to hang them around the city so that everyone who wished could help his mother. The naivety of the idea knew no bounds, but for a little boy it seemed very interesting. When John came home, he talked a little with his mother and then told her about his acquaintance with the old janitor, who turned out to be a nice old man 
with a kind and responsive heart. Listening to her son's confused story, Karen could hardly hold back the tears that were trying to come out of her eyes. No, she had to hold on. You mustn't let it get to you. John was doing well. He is so small, and he is holding on and supporting me, thought the woman respectfully. Little did she know that on the bottom shelf of an old chest of drawers, she carefully kept a picture of the guy who was her first and only love. She and Peter had met by chance and also by chance separated. It's now Karen understands that it was all the fault of youth and hasty decision-making. And then everything that was happening seemed to her a beautiful fairy tale, which would last forever. Passionate meetings, walks under the moon, and mutual declarations of love filled the lives of young people with joy and meaning. Unfortunately, first loves are often unhappy, and so the example of Peter and Karen was a clear proof of that. If Olivia had not come between them, maybe it would have come to marriage. But the more experienced rival easily made Peter's head spin and took him away from Karen. That's why they say people meet, people fall in love. But for Karen, this passionate relationship with Peter turned into an unplanned pregnancy which she only found out about two months after the breakup. Many then condemned Karen for the haste and hastiness in making decisions. But it was difficult for the naive girl from the orphanage to imagine all the hardships associated with the future upbringing of a child alone. Then, in a wave of anger and contempt for Peter, Karen was ready to cut him out of her life forever. But time passed and old love, as you know, doesn't rust. It wasn't until John was four years old that she accidentally learned that Peter had tragically died. Trying to provide for his obnoxious wife, Olivia, the boy worked without sleep or rest in the cab service. It was because of overwork and chronic lack of sleep that Peter fell asleep, that Peter fell asleep at the wheel and flew off the road at full speed. The impact was so severe that the young guy died instantly. At the funeral, Karen didn't go. First, she did not know Peter's parents personally. And second, she could not find the strength to go to the coffin of her former lover without losing her feelings. Later, Karen repeatedly berated herself for this weak-willed act and even visited Peter in the cemetery. But all this happened after the funeral when it was pointless to talk about anything. As if to pay tribute to his memory, she carefully kept his picture in a drawer of her dresser and pulled it out only in moments of special mental anxiety or melancholy. Lately, she looked more and more often at the picture depicting her lover in the period when they were still in a relationship and enjoyed life together. So now, meeting her son in the hallway in his stroller, Karen fed him a rudimentary dinner and locked herself in her room again, alone with the picture of her late fiancé. John did not know to whom exactly the photograph belonged, so he preferred not to ask unnecessary questions. Especially now, he had better things to do. The boy had to tear out several pieces of paper and make handwritten notices. John stuck out the tip of his tongue with all the tension and painstakingly wrote out the text written by the elderly janitor. Since he was not yet in school, writing, even in block letters, was very difficult for him. After producing about a dozen or so notices, John felt very tired and began to turn up his nose. Tomorrow, a new task awaited him. The boy decided to stick ads on the doors of houses whose Sherman Ellens, for one reason or another, seemed to him wealthy people. For his six years, John was quite developed, and in part this was due to the fact that he realized his importance to his sick mother. The boy could read with a syllable, but his thoughts and thinking peculiarities were ahead of his peers in many issues. John could easily be sent to the store or drugstore without fear that he would buy the wrong thing or cross the road at a red light. In the back of her mind, Karen worried every time her son went for a walk in the yard. The woman understood that, in fact, the little boy was trying to find money for her surgery and was doing it the best he could. The next morning, John got up earlier than usual and immediately turned to his mother with an unusual request. The boy needed glue to put up his flyers around town. At the same time, the boy proudly kept the secret and did not want to reveal it under any circumstances. At first, Karen wanted some glue. 
but then she remembered that she'd had once had half a pack of wallpaper glue left over, which could now serve them well. After getting what he wanted, John took the manufactured advertisements and went outside. Because of his young age and lack of experience, the boy made one very unfortunate blunder that he did not even realize existed at that moment. In placing the ads, John was unaware that when filling them out, he had forgotten to include his contact information. That is, all his efforts could have gone in vain, and the flyers themselves could have been mistaken for someone's silly joke or prank. But six-year-old John sincerely believed that he could do it and stubbornly continued to put up ads. Already on the second spot, the boy was in for a setback. The owner of the expensive mansion came outside just as John was ready to stick the ad on the garage door sash. Hey, what are you doing there? Get out of here. I know you street kids. You're always trying to steal something without asking, the rich man shouted at the boy. Uncle, I only wanted to ask for help. My mother is sick, you see, cried John with tears in his eyes. But it was not easy to change the rich man's mind. The businessman saw the boy as a common rascal or a bum looking for a better place to steal something of value. With an exasperated look on his face, John moved on. The vengeful rich man yelled after him for a long time, trying to hurt him as much as he could. But John had a goal, and he pursued it with an astonishing persistence for his age. Methodically going from one object to another, the boy himself did not notice how he used up almost all the leaflets. John had only two flyers to glue when approaching another two-story mansion. He saw something strange. At first, the boy thought it was a trick of the eye and did not rely on his eyes. But when John came closer, his astonishment was boundless. The gate was ajar, and the boy could see what was happening at that moment in the yard. At first sight, nothing much happened. The tenants of the rich house were moving back and forth in the yard, going about their business. Everything would have been fine if a curious John had not noticed one of the women standing in the courtyard, that this stranger lived in this house. The boy had no doubt and was sure he was right. John, as if spellbound, watched only the stranger and could not take his eyes off. The boy's astonishment was explained very simply. The fact was that before him he saw his own mother, who not only wore an expensive dress, but also moved around without any gurney or anyone's help. Mother, how did you get here? John exclaimed, which immediately drew the attention of the occupants of the house. The woman looked in astonishment at the boy who was holding a glue pot and a couple of sheets of paper with a pen. And with a negative shake of her head, she answered, No, kid, you're mistaken. The woman added in a shaky voice and was about to leave the house when John rushed toward her with outstretched arms. The boy's consciousness refused to accept that the woman standing in front of him might not be his mother. The exact same voice, exquisite facial features, and hair the color of ripe chestnut were exactly the same as the closest person to John on earth. Mommy, mommy, are you finally cured? cried the little boy through his tears not even aware that the Govokatrin is a complete stranger to him. The mistress of the house tried to pull away from the strange little boy, but it was not easy to do. John was so glad and happy that his mother was finally relieved, but at that moment a sullen man of about thirty came out of the house and looked at the boy with undisguised irritation. Catherine, who the hell is that? Do you have children on the side? The stranger asked with an arrogant expression on his lower lip. The woman, who was an exact copy of John's mother, shrugged her shoulders bewildered and taking the boy by the shoulders asked, Kid, what are you doing? Look, you've made a mistake. I don't know you. Karen, Karen, said the boy. Well, well, I'm Catherine. I can't be your mother, do you understand? The landlady answered calmly, without irritation. Only now John realized that he had made a mistake, though the boy loved fantasy cartoons, but was well aware that, in reality, it cannot be, which means that his mother is still at home in a wheelchair, and the money for the operation must be collected at any cost. Meanwhile, the lady of the house looked at the little boy with pity, and then said, Kid, you must be hungry, right? And I have just baked cherry pie. 
and chocolate candy. Why don't you come in? John looked intently at Catherine and was once again surprised by her resemblance to her mother. If it weren't for Karen's injury, it would have been very hard to tell them apart. Since John hadn't had much breakfast today, at the mere mention of food, the boy's stomach rumbled invitingly, making him smile embarrassingly. So hungry then. Come on, you can put your papers up later. By the way, what do you have there? Catherine asked, taking the boy's hand in hers. It's not a piece of paper, ma'am. It's an advertisement asking for help. My mother is sick and needs an operation. That's how I get money, answered John, just like a grown-up. So you're begging. Well, that's what I thought. You're all like that. You make up a lot of stories for yourselves, and then you fool the gullible people. Sherman, stop it. Can't you see that the boy needs help? John, caught between two fires, did not know what to do next. Until a few minutes ago, he'd been peacefully putting up flyers. Now, he found a woman who looked just like his mother. Well, I'll have a bite to eat. And then we'll see, he thought and followed Catherine. The house smelled pleasantly of some delicious and spices, which made John's mouth instantly filled with saliva. Catherine quickly gathered on the table and put in front of the boy a delicious slice of pie, a saucer of sweets, and a cup of fragrant lime tea. Wow. Thank you very much. Took a bite and thanked John. Catherine watched with a smile as the boy was eating and caught herself thinking that more than anything in the world, she wanted to have a baby. Unfortunately, all the woman's previous attempts had been unsuccessful, and it had become her number one problem in life. Then, Catherine turned her gaze to John the sheets of paper, which he had thoughtfully placed on the edge of the table. Taking one of them in her hands, the woman ran her eyes over what was written, and tears sprang to her eyes by themselves. Catherine looked at the childish, inept scribbles and felt her heart shrink with pity. Poor little boy. God. Why should he have to go through all this? The boy needs to get ready for school. Not go around town with ads to help his mother. Thought Catherine. She still couldn't get the boy's words out of her head that she was just like his mother. No way. I don't think so. It's probably just an ordinary resemblance. It happens. Catherine tried to reassure herself. Meanwhile, John finished his breakfast and thanked his hostess again. Catherine smiled and stroked the boy's head. For some inexplicable reason, she felt sympathy for this sweet boy, who through the fault of an evil fate faced such an unpleasant problem. The woman had grown up in a wealthy family and had never known the troubles and sorrows of a lack of money. Her parents were influential businessmen who provided her with everything she needed for a comfortable life. Catherine herself was a smart woman and therefore did not waste time and had a reputation as a successful economist. Since due to poor health of her father decided to retire from the business, she had to take his place and lead the company. Of course, Catherine insistently wanted her parents to be forever young and never get old. But the inexorable age... But the inexorable age was doing its work, and sooner or later, they would retire sooner or later. Catherine had no luck in her personal life. She already had failed marriage with a guy who turned out to be an alphanist and a boozer. The current suitor, rich heiress Sherman, reputedly responsible and serious, which inspired her hope for a favorable relationship. But Catherine confused his moodiness. He behaved unceremoniously, as if everyone in town owed him something. After feeding John, Catherine decided to give him groceries to take home. In her opinion, the boy was too young to walk alone through such a big city which was full of dangers. Sherman spoke out against it, but it was impossible to change Catherine's mind on that point. Deep down, the woman had long wanted to take a child from the orphanage, but every time something prevented it. Talking to little John, Catherine felt the very warmth and tenderness that comes only in the heart of a loving mother. Putting the baby in the back seat of her car, the woman drove him to the specified address. There was no more talk about putting up ads, because John himself had realized the pointlessness of his venture. Will you come and see my mother? 
Don't go, please. You must see her, the boy pleaded. At first, Catherine did not want to meet the boy's mother. The woman was convinced that the boy's mother just looked like her and nothing more. But when a woman finally accepted John's offer and entered the apartment, her amazement knew no bounds. To say that Catherine was surprised was to say nothing. At first it seemed to the woman that she was looking into some bad projection of the mirror, which alters the image so much that from a perfectly healthy person, it makes a feeble invalid. But looking more closely, Catherine realized that all this is happening here and now. God, we look like twin sisters. Oh, I didn't believe John yet, she thought. Karen felt the same way when she saw her exact duplicate. Hello, muttered the landlady and pulled her wheelchair closer. Good afternoon, answered Karen in the same trembling voice. The most interesting thing was that the women had already seen each other's distinctive birthmarks on the neck, which looked exactly the same. All the time John stood beside them and kept his eyes on his mother and Aunt Catherine. It seemed like a miracle. But the women really did look like two peas in a pod. A little later, when the passions of the initial meeting had subsided, Catherine and Karen were already sitting in the kitchen and over a cup of hot tea and shared their thoughts on everything that had happened. I grew up in an orphanage and never knew my parents. So I am not much help in this matter. Karen was the first to break the lingering pause. I, on the other hand, grew up in a wealthy family and probably had nothing to do with the orphanage. But that said, I'm pretty sure we're sisters. It couldn't have been any other way, Catherine thoughtfully stretched out. The women sat across from each other, and it seemed to them that they were looking into the reflection of themselves. Understanding that Karen needed help and support, Catherine promised to solve the problem of money and surgery. What the woman was most interested in was how it came to be that she had a twin sister all along. Oh, come see you in a couple of days, okay? I need to talk to my parents. My heart knows they have something to say about it, Catherine said as she smiled. Come by all means, Aunt Catherine. I will be waiting for you. And my mother will be waiting for you too. Right, Mom, shouted John. Of course, son, Karen whispered with tears in her eyes. But this time they were tears of happiness, not sadness or sadness. The woman knew that from now on she was not a single mother, and now she would have close and dear people in her life. But John was the happiest of all, and a glimmer of hope shone in his eyes. The boy was so excited that he wanted to share the good news with someone. Since Vincent was the only friend John had ever had, the first person to hear of this change in his life was the old janitor. There you see, kid. It all worked out and you were worried. That's because you made the right ad. Although, of course, it's a joke, the old man smiled. Thank you, Grandpa. Is it possible to write something like that? Something that would change your life? You're smart. Go ahead, write a sample, and I'll put up ads around town. You'll see. We'll be sure to find you a family, John suggested in a childishly naive way. Tears came to Vincent's eyes. Thank you, John, but I don't think any ad will do me any good. Not even the most magic ad would do me any good. I'm all alone, you know. No one but cats and dogs. I'm not complaining. I live well in the basement, don't you think so? answered the old man quietly. At this moment, John would have given anything in the world so that there would be a change for the better in Vincent's life. Don't be sad, Grandpa. Here, I found Aunt Catherine. And you will find someone. True, I do not know where she was all this time. But better late than never. Trying to support the old man, John said. The janitor shook his head and hurried to move the conversation to a less painful for him topic. Telling John about the habits of dogs and cats, the old man felt like the teacher he had once wanted to be, but never became. Vincent was very happy that the boy was able to help his mother and, in parallel, to find his relatives. The old man knew that God works in mysterious ways and that none of us knows what awaits us around the next corner. Not so long ago, he himself had lived a normal life and had no idea that he would soon find himself on the streets among vagrants, stray animals, 
and hopeless poverty. Conversation with John gave Vincent the illusion that he was a normal man who, like others his age, had a beloved grandchild, relatives, and a secure old age. The old man could have entered into a court battle and tried to wrest his apartment from his daughter-in-law. But Vincent, on the other hand, did not want to deprive the woman of her home. If only because she had once been the wife of his dead son, what would I need the apartment for? Not today or tomorrow I would die, and then what? Why all these reverences with lawsuits and lawyers? Thought the old man. Three days flew by unnoticed, during which Karen and her son were on pins and needles. That was because they were waiting for the arrival of Catherine, who had promised to find out everything possible. Time passed, and the woman was still gone. Mom, what if... Aunt Catherine is mad at us and won't come anymore. It happens, doesn't it, doesn't it? Doesn't it, John asked one day. Karen herself stubbornly drove the thought away, but of course she did not tell her son about it. Catherine was only the fifth day. As soon as she crossed the threshold of the apartment, a woman conspiratorially announced that she had two news. So, which one to start with? The good one or the very good one, Catherine asked. The very good news, of course, answered John for everyone. Well, well, listen to me. First of all, we do not need to go abroad, and I found a suitable clinic in our country. Its experts are ready to help us in this matter. Secondly, I've already prepaid for the surgery and the consultation beforehand. In three days, you, Karen, will need to be in the capital, said, off the top of my head, Catherine. And the second news, Aunt Catherine. Well, don't keep me in suspense, John pleaded. Catherine smiled and continued her story. As it turned out, the good news was that Catherine and Karen were indeed each other's sisters. It turned out that for many years Tyrone and Anna had kept a terrible secret that deprived them of peace and did not let them live in harmony all these years. Then 28 years ago, a woman named Anna gave birth to two beautiful twin girls. At first all was well, but then the wrong thing happened. On that fateful day when Karen and Catherine were born, there was a terrible storm that left almost the whole town without light. The maternity ward was immediately connected to the generator substation, which was specially maintained for this purpose. When the light returned to the maternity ward, the nurses saw that the baby was missing, and it happened in the most mysterious way. All the staff were in place, and there was simply no one to blame for the crime. It was only later Tyrone received an anonymous letter offering a ransom for the kidnapped daughter. The businessman was ready to give any money just to get his beloved little girl back. Unfortunately, the negotiations resulted to nothing, and whether the kidnappers had originally intended not to return the girl, or they deliberately wanted to cause moral damage to the businessman, but the twin sister, Catherine, was never returned. Tyrone then involved all the connections in the police, the prosecutor's office, and other law enforcement agencies. Unfortunately, it did not lead to anything definite. Many years had passed since then, and the businessmen came to terms with their loss. But when Catherine told her parents that their sister had been found, they couldn't have been happier. Telling Karen about it, the woman saw an indescribable joy in her eyes. Sitting in the stroller, the woman covered her eyes with her hands and cried. They were tears of relief and joy she had not known for years. Meanwhile, Catherine winked at John and quietly opened the front door. At the same time, Tyrone and Anna entered the hallway. When Karen opened her eyes, she gave a low groan and saw in front of her the parents she hadn't known since birth. It was truly a day of miracles which gave John and his mother confidence in a favorable outcome of the case. Forgive us, my daughter, for not being able to find you sooner. Anna whispered with tears in her eyes. Don't cry, Mommy. Everything will change. I will have an operation, and we will all live together, Karen whispered. Tyrone was more reserved, and his thoughts were in the past, when the businessman was told that he was going to have twins. Now that the family was reunited again, Karen's surgery was at the top of the agenda. Since she was to fly to the capital to look after John, volunteered Catherine. 
Tyrone and Anna decided to support their daughter and go with her. In part, it was caused by guilt, and in part by a desire to be near their own daughter, who 28 years had not known their love and affection. After seeing his mother off to the airport, John returned home with his aunt Catherine. Birds were singing in the boy's soul, because he not only found his aunt, but also found his own grandparents. Looking out the window, John saw Byron sitting on the bench. The dog Thunder was nestled at the old man's feet, and now and then he tried to lick his master's face. Auntie Catherine, can I invite Grandpa Vincent to visit? I'm sure Mom will not mind. It's him. He helped me find you. Timidly asked the boy. Catherine comprehensively smiled and said, Well, if Grandpa Vincent is so good, then let him come. After receiving permission, John rushed out into the street to hug the old man and invite him to visit. The elderly janitor at first was reluctant and flatly refused to cross the threshold of John's apartment. But then, pulling himself together, the old man decided to come in for a cup of tea. Thunder sat down on the steps by the front door and patiently waited for his master. Catherine welcomed Vincent, who unknowingly helped John to find his relatives. The old man spoke briefly about himself, not forgetting to admit honestly that he was homeless. It's all right, Grandpa. When my grandparents will be back from the capital, we'll surely think of something for you. And for thunder, of course, the boy exclaimed. Oh, come now, my dear. My time is over, and I have nothing to make up now, said the old man sadly. Suddenly his gaze stopped at the picture on the kitchen table. On it was a picture of a young boy whose face seemed familiar to the old man. Vincent took the photograph and couldn't hold back his tears. The man looking at him was none other than his own son Peter, who had been killed in a car accident. Grandpa, what's the matter with you, said John. Alarmed by the old man's behavior, Catherine came up to him and gently touched his shoulder. Vincent looked up at her with tear-filled eyes and asked softly, This is my son. He died several years ago. Catherine looked at the elderly janitor in surprise and could not find an answer. She did not know where in her sister's house that picture had come from, since she personally had seen it for the first time. My mother often looks at it and cries. John said, looking over the old man's shoulder, she always thinks that no one sees her at that moment. But I peeped at her a couple of times, and I knew about it. Vincent's consciousness suddenly had a spark of epiphany. What if Karen was my Pavlik's first love? He'd always been secretive and never showed his love. And I, an old fool, never asked. I know Olivia. She threw me out of the house, the old man thought to himself. Despite Vincent's vehement protest, John, with his aunt's approval, offered to let the old man stay with them for a while. We'll put a kennel behind the house for thunder. Just don't chain him up and he'll be fine. The boy hastened to reassure the janitor. You have a good soul, dear. I feel my heart. You're not a stranger to me. And even if a stranger, I'll survive. I won't have grandchildren anyway, answered the old man. Fortunately, thanks to the professionalism of doctors and the latest equipment, the operation was a success, but rehabilitation was required for a long time. In the meantime, Karen will be under observation in the ward for a few weeks more. One day, after calling her sister, Catherine cautiously asked about the picture she had found and learned that her lover, Peter, was Vincent's son. John had no idea that he had brought his own grandfather off the street. The realization that he had been in contact with his own grandson all this time sent Vincent into a state of pleasant shock. The old man rejoiced and cried at the same time, still not believing the miracle that had happened to him. It is hard to say what would have happened if John had not met a kind janitor on the street who not only helped him find a family, but was also a kind-hearted grandfather. Turning on the video link, Catherine gave Vincent and Karen a chance to talk directly. The first phrase they spoke was, I'm sorry. It so happened that by the will of an evil fate, they had lost their closest and dearest person, who even after his death had managed to bring them together. Vincent never knew his son's first bride and was only acquainted with the divorcee who actually drove him out of the house. 
The most amazing thing about this story was that all of its characters essentially lived in the same city and did not even know about the existence of each other. Perhaps this is the reality of modern life, when even close people do not see each other for years and remember the family ties only when they themselves are bad. In about three weeks, Karen and her parents were finally able to return home. At the airport, she was met by the closest to her, which now consisted not only of one little John. In honor of the safe return of their daughter Tyrone and Anna, arranged a luxurious banquet at a restaurant, which was attended as the guest of honor Vincent. Having learned about the old man's love for dogs and cats, the businessman promised to open a shelter for homeless animals. Naturally, it would be run by Vincent himself. Sisters Catherine and Karen now see each other almost every day and cannot negovo Catrinzia. Relatives have been apart for 28 years. There is something to say. Well, most of all, it won John, who is bathed in affection and attention. The catering that from now on it will be forever. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Subscribe to the channel. Like it, write comments if you like the story. And see you on the channel.